Thank you so much for the kind invitation and the incredible hospitality from the society. Um, I used to live in Milano, actually, for four years. And uh, I've, I've decided that I like Madrid much better than Milano. It's a really beautiful town, and I'm not just saying that. Um, and also, thank you to all of the audience. I understand that the only thing between, um, between you and resting the wa watching the rest of the soccer game is my talk. So hopefully, I'll keep you interested, and that by the time I'm finished, the soccer game will still be on, so you can go and, and see the ultimate. Um, finale. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about work my lab has been doing in engineering regulatory T-cells to try and induce tolerance in the context of transplantation. And uh, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this problem in solid organ transplantation. The only way we have today to keep the graft is nonspecific immune suppression. And ultimately, we would really like to be able to harness the natural ability of the immune system to control uh, non, uh, control immunity to non-dangerous antigens to induce tolerance towards the graft. And my lab is interested in trying to shift this balance um, by modulating the uh, numbers and functions of regulatory T cells so that we have a diminished uh, number and function of conventional T cells, thereby reducing graft rejection. So the cells that I work on are cells that are defined by a transcription factor called FOXP3, uh, as well as a cell surface protein called CD25, which is the alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor. And what makes regulatory T cells special and different from conventional T cells is that they don't produce typical T cell derived cytokines. So like a conventional T cell that would, for example, contribute to organ rejection by making interferon gamma and TNF alpha, regulatory T cells don't make those cytokines. They also don't make IL-2. Uh, instead, what they do is they suppress uh, other immune cells, so not only other T cells, but also B cells, NK cells, and antigen-presenting cells. Uh, in humans, in blood, they make up about 1 to 3 percent of the CD4 positive T cells, but interestingly, we're now realizing in tissues they can be at a much higher proportion. Uh, for example, in the intestine, they can be up to 20 percent of your CD4 positive T cells. And in my lab, we like to think of them as the police of the immune system. So why are we so excited about Tregs? This is just one piece of data that I've stolen from my colleague Manuela Battaglia in Milano, where uh, she showed uh, several years ago that in an islet transplant model, this is in mouse, that if you put in an islet allograft and not, don't do any treatment, that graft will be very rapidly rejected. But if you co-inject regulatory T cells from the recipient, these cells will very potently prevent islet allograft rejection. This sort of result has been repeated many times by many groups around the world in all sorts of different animal models of transplantation um, and uh, has ultimately led to the idea that we should be able to uh, harness these cells to have a similar outcome in patients. So how do they achieve this remarkable suppressive effect? Regulatory T cells have about four different ways that they modulate immune responses and that are broadly classified into these four uh, categories. So the first is production of inhibitory cytokines. So I told you they don't make IL-2 or interferon, the inflammatory cytokines, but they do make immunosuppressive cytokines like TGF-beta and IL-10. They can also disrupt the metabolic environment by making suppressive molecules like adenosine. They can inhibit antigen-presenting cells by expressing this inhibitory receptor, CTLA-4, that actually physically removes CD80 and CD86 from the dendritic cells, also induces molecules like IDO that um, remove essential amino acids from the environment, and there's also some evidence that they can kill cells. So what's interesting about uh, these mechanisms, first of all, is that they all require cell proximity. So that means the Tregs need to be close by to the other immune cells that they're turning off. And it also gives them this property of bystander suppression. So that means that the, although Tregs need to be activated through their T cell receptor in order to be suppressive, once they're activated, they can regulate other types of immune cells in the local microenvironment. So this um, has all added up to the idea that, uh, based on all the evidence in animal models, that we should be able, in humans, to uh, use a couple of different approaches to try and harness these cells in the context of transplantation and also autoimmunity. 
One very common approach is to take regulatory T cells from the blood of the patient. Uh, a second approach is to take them from a third party source. And I'm going to tell you at the end of my talk some work we've been doing on getting these cells from the thymus. But overall, the idea is that for this therapy to work, you have to change that first slide I showed you where we're trying to modulate the balance between regulatory T cells and conventional cells. The idea is you need to really increase the number of Tregs so that you have proportionately more than conventional T cells. So in order to get enough cells, you have to grow them in vitro because as I told you, they're quite a small proportion in blood. Um, but once you've expanded them, you can generate billions of cells in the lab and then you can infuse them into the patient in the context of transplantation. Usually this is done uh, close to the time of the, the organ being transplanted. Um, this uh, idea is actively being tested around the world. Uh, this is a, a relatively recent summary of all of the clinical trials that are currently recruiting or, or about to be recruiting in solid organ transplantation. I think there's about uh, 10 or 15 trials on this list. You can see uh, there's activity in Europe um, as well as in America, uh, China, uh, and in Russia. So there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, and we're all anxiously awaiting the, the results of, uh, in particular, the trial in Europe that's happening right now, the one study led by Ed Geisler, uh, which has finished recruitment and hopefully will be presenting their data soon. So regulatory T cell therapy in humans is already happening, but there's still several outstanding questions. So one thing that's clear from animal models is that uh, because Tregs uh, are only active when you stimulate them through the T cell receptor, that if they are specific for the antigen of interest, they are obviously much more potent. In humans, it's been a bit difficult to figure out the best way to isolate and expand these cells. Um, although there are those four broad mechanisms of suppression, um, it's still not really clear how they're working in different diseases. And then there's also some um, concern that potentially regulatory T cells could um, become an unstable cell type and turn into a conventional cell in the face of too much inflammation. So my lab works on all of these different questions, but what I want to talk to you about today in the first part is work we're doing to try and tackle this problem to generate antigen-specific cells. And then if I don't run out of time, I'll give you a couple of slides on this last part, how to isolate and expand uh, stable Tregs. So coming to this question of polyclonal versus antigen-specific cells. So in a polyclonal population, that means we have not selected for any particular uh, type of T cell receptor. It's just whatever comes out of the patient, that's what you got. Um, but the problem with that approach is that very few of the cells are actually going to be activated by the antigen of interest. In transplantation, it's actually the best case scenario because up to 10% of your cells will just be naturally alloantigen specific. But that means that 90% of the cells you're infusing into the patient are not useful at all. So that's a waste of resources, it's a waste of cell culture media, and it's potentially harmful to the patient because you're putting in a lot of cells that potentially could have uh, undesired immunosuppressive side effects. So there's um, the traditional way to try and enrich for antigen-specific cells in the context of transplantation would be to in vitro repetitively stimulate uh, the regulatory T cells with a source of donor an antigen. This definitely works. Um, it works the best if you have multiple MHC mismatches, but it's quite cumbersome and time-consuming. Another approach you can do is to uh, overexpress a transgenic T cell receptor, but in transplantation, this is really not feasible because every donor recipient combination will have um, a different alpha paired alpha beta T cell receptor and a different peptide antigen. So you'd need a very highly personalized approach. So we decided a few years ago to take an approach that had been developed in the cancer immunotherapy world to use uh, what we call chimeric antigen receptors to engineer the specificity of regulatory T cells. So for those of you who aren't familiar with chimeric, and antigen, chimeric antigen receptors, I just want to take you through a little bit of the structure and the history. So I call them, they're sort of like a cross between an antibody or, or a, the B cell receptor and the T cell receptor. So what they are is you take the antigen binding domain from a monoclonal antibody, um, both the heavy chain and the light chain, and you fuse them together with a short linker in the middle to make this into a single chain antibody. Then uh, you use molecular cloning to fuse that to a transmembrane domain and then bits and pieces from the T cell receptor and other molecules that will stimulate T cells. 
This process has gone through a few different generations. The first generation chimeric antigen receptors just had the signaling domains from the T cell receptor complex. It turned out they didn't work that well. Uh, what they needed was also addition of co-stimulatory molecules like CD28 in the so-called second generation cars. And now there's people working on third and fourth generation cars, adding in more and more signaling domains. But the major advantage of these cells is that they're very modular. You can mix and match a bit like a puzzle, take pieces from different receptors that you're interested in, fuse them together, and then give the cells um, the ability to bind to antigen in a way that's now independent from the MHC peptide complex, so more like an antibody. Um, and the transplantation, the major advantage here is that, as I said, they become MHC independent. So this has been extremely successful in the cancer immunology world. Probably many of you uh, have heard about this in the news. Um, and in particular, um, targeting tumor cells that are arising from B cells, so they're blood cancer malignancies. And uh, the process is to basically take a patient who's um, who's uh, refractory to all common methods, to take out their T cells, put in a chimeric antigen receptor against CD19, which is a cell surface marker on the leukemic cells, then grow them up in the lab, infuse them back into the patient, and you can get incredible remissions that are uh, on the order of more than 70% in a patient population that otherwise was refractory to all other treatments. And this has now led to the FDA approval of two different uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cell products. This is a picture of one of them um, sold by Novartis in this unpronounceable name. Um, and it's just kind of cool to see this bag of T cells labeled as human T cells. So um, our idea was to take this idea from cancer immunotherapy and apply it in transplantation. So we thought if we made a chimeric antigen receptor and put it into Tregs, we could then uniformly redirect their specificity to the donor organ. And the way we decided to test this was by making a chimeric antigen receptor specific for HLA-A2. It's a very commonly mismatched uh, class one antigen. For example, at the University of Toronto, about 25% of uh, transplants will be mismatched where the donor organ is A2 positive and the recipient is A2 negative. So the idea would be that uh, in this context, uh, with no regulatory T cell treatment, the patient's A2 negative immune cells would be obviously very interested in rejecting this A2 positive organ, but that if we then infused patient cells that were all A2 positive, um, they would uh, now be able to do a couple of things. So first of all, they would become activated by HLA-A2, which would make them suppressive. And secondly, they'd be activated in the local microenvironment of the graft, which then gives them this bystander suppression capacity. So as I mentioned at the beginning, once the cell is activated, they can suppress other immune responses going on in the environment because obviously there's gonna be more than just class one, HLA-A2, mismatched between the donor and the recipient. So this was an idea we came up with around 2012, um, and a couple of years ago, we published the first report that uh, this does indeed work very well. So we made a, a chimeric antigen receptor where we had the extracellular antigen binding domain specific for HLA-A2, and then we put, used a classical second generation CAR format using CD28 as the co-stimulatory molecule and CD3 zeta as the T cell activating domain. And the system we use is a, a lentiviral transduction system. Uh, where we have our A2 car under control of a strong promoter, and we use this truncated nerve growth factor receptor as a transduction marker. And then we use this other car against HER2, which is a car from the cancer world uh, relevant in breast cancer, but in our system we use it as a negative control because it's not an antigen that's relevant in the, in the models we're working in. So basically what we do is we take Tregs from HLA-A2 negative donors, we transduce them with this lentivirus, purify the transduced cells, and after a couple of weeks, do all our experiments. Uh, and these cells remain uh, Tregs. I'm not gonna show you all the data, but they, they don't lose expression of FOXP3 or any of the other defining characteristics. Um, so one of the, so we've tested these cells in many different ways. I just want to show you a snapshot of some of the, the data. So one of the ways we test these cells is in a very classical mixed lymphocyte reaction. Many of you have probably done this sort of experiment where you take um, an a antigen presenting cell, which is of donor origin, use it to stimulate recipient derived T cells, which will proliferate in response to the donor LO antigens. And then we can add in uh, our A2 CAR Tregs or control Tregs and see what happens. And this is uh, what we um, 
we call a suppression assay, where we're looking at increasing, or sorry, in this case, decreasing number of Tregs. So this is Tregs at a one-to-one -one ratio to the T cells with a two-fold dilution out. Uh, if you just use polyclonal Tregs in blue, they will suppress a mixed lymphocyte reaction. That's been known for almost 20 years. But you can see these are a different series of A2-specific cars that have been transduced into our Tregs. You can see how much more potent these A2-specific car Tregs are at suppressing this mixed lymphocyte reaction in comparison to the polyclonal control. Um, the other thing we've been interested in is trying to understand where these cells go. So I mentioned at the beginning, it's uh, Tregs need to be at the local site to mediate bystander suppression. So we've now been working on setting up models of skin transplants to try and look in more detail at what happens to these cells in vivo. So this is an animal model where we're taking immunodeficient NSG mice and then transplanting them with skin grafts that are either A2 negative or A2 positive. And the nice thing is that we can put these grafts next door to each other so each mouse is its own internal control. We then prepare the human Tregs with the car, and we make one additional adjustment, which is to also transduce them with luciferase, so we can then use bioluminescent imaging to follow these cells in the mouse. So this is an example of what some of the data look like. So on the left, these are mice that have been, uh, that both mice have been uh, transplanted with either the A2 negative or the A2 positive graft. The A2 positive graft is this one down here with the little dots around it. So if you inject the mice with the polyclonal Tregs, after three days, you can see that they're sort of uh, dif dispersed um, in both grafts, sort of non-uniformly, uh, not, uniformly, not polarized towards one or the other, whereas the A2 CAR Tregs have almost exclusively migrated to the A2 positive graft. If we look at this in more detail over time, this here is a series of uh, bioluminescent imaging in mice uh, that have been uh, injected with the HER2 CAR Tregs. So you can see that, um, that initially they go to where the skin grafts are, and then after about three days, the cells have completely disappeared. They're gone, likely because they don't have a source of antigen anymore. But if you look at what happens to the A2 CAR Tregs, initially they, they go to both graphs equally, but then with time, they gradually focus more and more strongly on the A2 positive graft. And you can see here by 14 days, they're just exclusively at this antigen bearing graft. And then what's interesting is that after 21 days, we start to see uh, exit of the regulatory T cells from the graft to what appeared to be possibly a local draining lymph node, which then meant we could harvest these cells and look at them them by flow cytometry uh, in more detail. So this here, this is uh, at the end point in 21 days, a, a closer up picture of the mice that got either the HER2 CAR Tregs or the A2 CAR Tregs. You can see here they all are in the A2 positive graft. And then in these mice, we were able to also harvest the lymph nodes from next door to the graft and do flow cytometry. Uh, and what we were amazed to see, so this is uh, the data from the lymph node on the bottom and then the spleen as a control on the top. So the cells essentially are not in the spleen. The way we look for these cells is by staining with an A2 to tetramer, which is a recombinant MHC molecule, uh, as well as FOXP3. So the cells are essentially not there in the spleen, but they're all here in the lymph node. Um, you can see that these cells have remained FOXP3 positive and they've remained CAR positive, suggesting that what happens to these cells is they initially go to the graft where they're able to divide, but then eventually leave the graft and go to the local lymph node where they can then educate other T cells uh, as part of the tolerance process. We're now going on to test the function of these cells in a human skin transplant model. So rather than transplanting a piece of mouse skin, this is now a piece of uh, HLA-A2 positive human skin uh, with a, a similar system where we're injecting, uh, in this case, autologous PBMCs, uh, which will reject the skin with or without the uh, A2CAR Tregs and monitoring what is going to happen. This is just a snapshot of some of the immunofluorescence data. So in uh, mice that are not treated with any human cells, they'll have this beautiful, beautiful epidermal layer of human skin. In mice that are given PBMCs alone, that layer is basically destroyed, which is uh, here the loss of the green involucrine signal, uh, as well as gain of this KI67 signal, which is indicative of proliferating keratinocytes trying to repair the destruction that's happening in the skin. And you can see here the mice that got PBMCs with the A2CAR Tregs, this uh, destruction of the epidermal layer and proliferation of keratinocytes is completely prevented.
Uh, the other thing that happens is just like I showed you in the animal model of trafficking to the mouse A2 positive skin, the A2 CAR T regs very specifically traffic to the human A2 positive skin. So this is immunostaining for FOXP3. Um, it's a lower magnification in the zoomed in version here on the bottom. So you can see in mice that got either PBS or PBMC, there's essentially uh, no T regs in those skin allografts. But in the mice that got the A2 CAR T regs, you can see there's all these beautiful CD45 positive, FOXP3 positive cells infiltrating the skin. And this is exclusively specific to the skin because if we look histologically at other organs in these mice, like the, the gut or the uh, liver, we don't see any Tregs. They've all homed to the site of antigen in the skin. So in conclusion, for the first part of my talk, I didn't show you all the data, but for any of you who are interested in this, um, you can go and look at our paper in JCI a couple of years ago showing that expression of a second generation car in Tregs does not affect any aspect of their in vitro function. Um, or phenotype, they can rapidly and specifically traffic to the A2 positive skin and seem to remain there indefinitely. So far, we've only taken the experiments out for about one month, but we're now doing experiments over a much longer period of time. And I think what's really interesting is this ability of the cells to eventually leave the graft, uh, particularly because in animal models, it's very well known that for cells to induce tolerance, they need to be both in the graft and the local draining lymph node. And importantly, they remain FOXP3 positive. Um, and diminish the rejection of A2-positive skin grafts. So we've now teamed up with a French company called TXL, um, who are taking this technology to a first-in-human clinical trial, which will be done in the context of uh, kidney transplantation, uh, likely starting sometime in 2019. It'll be done in Europe, so it's going to be a really exciting uh, first-in-human clinical trial of the first ever genetically modified Tregs. So in the last uh, few minutes remaining, I want to come to this, uh, this part of uh, the work in my lab, which is how to best isolate and expand potent and stable Tregs. So one of the big challenges in humans is that the only reliable cell surface marker we have to identify uh, Tregs is CD25, this alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor. Um, the other thing I need to tell you is that in humans, there's a few different places where you can find Tregs. You can find them in the thymus, where they develop as part of the natural process of T cell selection. But of course, you also find them in the blood, where there's two different types of regulatory T cells. There's the ones that have come from the thymus, uh, and they remain naive in CD45 RE positive. But you can also develop Tregs in the periphery. The problem is that in the periphery, you also have conventional T cells that are activated CD25 positive, but not expressing FOXP3. So in most of the Treg trials that are going on right now, when people are using peripheral blood as the source of Tregs, they end up with a mixture of all these different kinds of cells, which is very unsatisfactory because you never know from one patient to the next how many of these contaminating effector T cells you're going to have that could potentially make things much worse than you intended. You can partially overcome this problem by using cord blood as a source of regulatory cells because cord blood is, is mostly uh, depleted of these effector T cells. But the problem with cord blood is a very, very small amount of regulatory T cells. And in fact, usually you have to pool more than one cord together to get enough cells for a clinical application. So a few years ago, we teamed up with Laurie West at the University of Alberta to test this idea that maybe we should just go back to the beginning of Tregs and see whether or not we could, from the thymus, get cells that would be suitable for a cell therapy product. Um, so for, uh, for those of you who um, are not familiar with this field, the thymus um, is a uh, is an uh, organ obviously close to the heart. Uh, it is where T cells develop. So we have our immature T cells that will be double positive for CD4 and CD8, and our mature T cells that become single CD4 positive. And a proportion of these single positive CD4 uh, T cells will be a FOXP3 positive. So here around 7% uh, of the cells. And the interesting thing is that during cardiac surgery in children, the thymus is actually quite a proportionally large organ, and it's in the way of the surgeons. And so the surgeons uh, take all or at least a portion of it out and throw it in the garbage, which as an immunologist seems incredibly depressing, but uh, there's hundreds of thymuses being thrown out around the world every day. So we thought this would be a great potential source of human Tregs. 
So we set up to try and uh, expand these cells from the thymus using uh, an in vitro culture system, which is quite uh, straightforward, stimulating the cells through the T cell receptor, IL-2, the cytokine that they need for a growth factor, and uh, we add in a little bit of rapamycin to make sure we don't get any outgrowth of conventional T cells. And we found that we can very readily uh, expand um, thymic t regs, so this is a fold expansion over uh, 11 days in culture. So on the left here, this is looking over time at thymic t regs, and on the right here, we're comparing this to blood t regs. So these are the t regs, and these are conventional T cells. So the interesting thing about the thymic t regs is they never expand as much as the blood t regs, but that's actually good because it's indicative of the fact that they're not uh, contaminated with a lot of effector T cells because it's known that T regs don't grow as much as effector T cells. And importantly, these cells remain very positive for FOXP3, the transcription factor that defines the T reg lineage. Um, and in fact, in some other work, we've shown that these cells are even can be higher for FOXP3 in comparison to the controlled blood peripheral T cells. Um, we have done quite a lot of work on these cells. You can look at some of our recent papers um, for all the details, but I just want to share with you um, some of the ways we study these cells in vivo and animal models. So in this case, we're uh, doing what's called a model of xenogeneic graft-versus-host disease, where immunodeficient mice are injected with human PBMCs in the absence or presence of Tregs, and then monitored over time for the development of graft-versus-host disease. And what we found is that whereas uh, blood Tregs will cause a delay of the graft versus host disease, this is based on survival, that the thymic T regs are actually much more potent. So again, this is because it's a much more pure product without contaminating cells. And also the cells, because they're naive and they're from a very young child, um, have much longer telomeres and are much less subjected to, uh, to apoptosis. They're a much more viable population of cells. So this just summarizes uh, some of the advantages of thymic Treg cells for uh, cell therapy. So one thing is that it's a very rich source of cells. So just so you have an idea of the scale, one gram of thymus has 500 times more Tregs than a milliliter of blood. And in fact, one thymus from a baby has uh, basically the same number of Tregs as in the entire blood volume of a 70 kilogram adult. Um, I didn't show you the data, but I just mentioned that these cells have very long telomeres, which means they're very naive, young cells, and they're very easy to expand. Uh, and in vivo models, they're uh, more potent than blood Tregs uh, and also more resistant to the effects of inflammatory cytokines. So some of you may be thinking, so how would we use these cells if they're coming from a baby? So there's two different places that we're working towards a clinical application now. So in my lab, we're very interested in developing these cells as a third-party cell therapy. Uh, in the context of transplantation, this is feasible because we're talking about a patient population that's on immunosuppressive drugs, uh, where there would be a window of time where it's permissive to infuse people with cells that have uh, mismatched HLA molecules. This is actually relatively common uh, in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Um, and in fact, third-party Tregs have already been shown to work in a variety of animal models, so they can enhance bone marrow engraftment as effectively as donor-derived Tregs. Uh, they can protect from graft-versus-host disease, although they do definitely survive for a shorter period of time, which you would expect, because as the immune system reconstitutes, they will, uh, uh, these animals will eventually reject the HLA-mismatched uh, third-party Tregs. And this has also been shown by Angus Thompson in non-human primates. But because uh, the idea behind the regulatory T cell therapy is that you don't need them for a long term because eventually they will give their properties to the host immune system, that we don't need them to last forever, a short bolus of cells should be enough to then induce long-term tolerance. The second place uh, we're collaborating to try and use them is with a group here in Madrid as an autologous uh, T cell therapy. And this is in the context of uh, children who are, who are having their thymus removed because they're about to have a heart transplant. Uh, we're really excited to be working with uh, Rafael Correra Roca because Spain, as you all know, is um, a leader in transplantation and because of your system, you do many more heart transplants uh, in children than in Canada and also there's many more 
heart, many more transplants that are done as the first heart surgery. So in Canada, often because we have such a shortage of pediatric donors, they'll, the children will have many surgeries before they eventually, to try and uh, as a short-term correction of the heart problem, before they actually get a transplant. So in Canada, it's not possible for us to procure a thymus at the time the child is having the heart transplant. But here in Madrid, that is possible, and so Rafael, we've been working together with him to scale up this product, and he hopes to be able to start this clinical trial in a small cohort of patients later on this year. So um, overall, um, my lab is really interested in taking uh, regulatory T cell therapy to what we call the next generation. So I showed you all those clinical trials that are going on now with a relatively crude approach, taking polyclonal cells, growing up very large numbers, and then just sort of hoping for the best. We think that taking more refined approaches by doing things like engineering antigen specificity using chimeric antigen receptors will be a way that we can use fewer cells and make sure that those cells are more potent. Um, and this is kind of a complicated figure, but it also shows you that from the basic science, we've learned a huge amount about the biology of regulatory T cells recently. So we've learned about how it's important for them to go to the right place. We've learned that they potentially can control B cell responses um, and that they may have functional, uh, functional specialization around things like tissue repair or responding to particular cytokines. And so I think in the next five years, what we're going to see is people taking all this knowledge knowledge from basic science and trying to apply that in the clinical context for the next generation of regulatory T-cell therapies. So my, my timer has gone red, which is perfect. Um, so I just want to end by uh, acknowledging the people in my lab who've done all this work. So the work on thymic Tregs was all done by a graduate student, Rami Hopley, now being taken over by another student, Katie McDonald, and it's been a long-standing collaboration with Esme Dyke and Laurie West at the University of Alberta. And the work on CAR Tregs is being led by Nick Dawson, who's here at the TTS conference, and he'll be giving a talk, uh, I think, on Tuesday. So if you want to track him down and pick his brain, you can watch out for him. Uh, with a lot of support from uh, Rami Hopley, Caroline Lamarche, and Majid Mojibian. So thank you very much for your attention.